So welcome everyone to Discovery Speaker Series. My name is Clarissa Felling. I'm the Program and Volunteer Coordinator for the Puget Sound Estuarium. We host these opportunities for an artist, scientist, earth advocate, or educator to share about their current work, research, or organization to spark conversations. So if you have anything that you want to ask these presenters today, you can type them in the Q&A below. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. If you need something to keep your hands busy while you listen in, you can download and print off our free coloring page that one of our volunteers drew. We've got some nice kelp and spiny dog fish sharks in there. And then as a reminder, if you do have to leave early, or if you know that someone else would really want to listen in on this presentation, we will be posting it to the Estuarium's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Tonight, we are very excited to have Dr. Jody Toft and Aurora Oseguera to present from the Puget Sound Restoration Fund. They'll be talking about how they've been restoring kelp forests in Puget Sound with some methods like seed banking. And then we'll also get to hear from Dr. E Dr. Zachary Randell from the Seattle Aquarium, who is their research scientist and does a lot of work monitoring kelp forests with the use of underwater drones. So we are very excited to have you all take the time out of your very busy schedules to share about your work with our community and answer their questions. So if you're ready to get started, Jody, you can go ahead. Wonderful, can you hear me all right? Sounds good. Okay, and more importantly, can you see a beautiful blade of bull kelp on your screen? You can, okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, so hi everyone, thanks so much for taking time out of your rainy Thursdays to come in really dive into a uh, kelp forest. Um, Aurora and Zach and I are excited to spend the time with you and share our work. And we wanna thank the Estuarium for, um, for reaching out to us and making this space for this talk. Um, I'm Jody Toft, I'm the Deputy Director of Puget Sound Restoration Fund. And I come to this work um, with, uh, with a lot of passion and joy and appreciation for the marine environment. Uh, I've been in this game as a scientist and conservation and restoration practitioner for a few decades at this point. Um, I'm a local yokel having grown up on Capitol Hill um, and I, I love these waters, which I consider my home waters. And core to my home waters is, uh, is this beautiful biogenic habitat, uh, which here we're showing you bull kelp. And Aurora is gonna to touch a little bit more on what bull kelp is and some of the magical uh, qualities of it, but not yet. So I'll dive in here. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So just by way of background uh, about the organization where Aurora and I work, we work at Puget Sound Restoration Fund. Uh, we're a small nonprofit. Um, here we've got 19 staff, but we've got a couple photos and bios missing here. So I think we're maybe up to 21 staff by now. Founded in 1997 uh, by Betsy Peabody, who's shown up in the upper left corner of my screen. Um, and really the, the core of what we do is to design, test, and spearhead in-water actions. And those actions are meant to restore Puget Sound's marine habitats, species, and waters for people and place. People are really matter. People really matter to the work that we do and where we do that work in Puget Sound is really important to us. Really the vision is that we could go to each, any water body within the Puget Sound area and say, we've done something here that's put good back into this place. And we've done that with the intention um, of the surrounding community um, first, you know, front, front and center, um, as well as the, um, as well as the tribes that have usual and accustomed areas in the places where we're doing our work. Uh, the we here is a grand we. And so here is my logo bar slide, which I love to show. Uh, these are folks who we work with um, across our work to restore Olympia oysters, pinto abalone, bulk help, 
a basket cockles, a whole, whole host of um, organisms, Dungeness crab is our newest program. Um, and so the we in the marine environment, and I, I, I always like to, to make a point of this, if you're gonna do work in the marine environment, it's work with a lot of folks because water moves around and it's tough to own water. And so the collective work that we do truly is collective work. And in the talk today, let me just highlight a couple partners, right? I'm not gonna go through all the gold stars, but the kelp work in and of itself is even more collaborative than I would say any of our other programs. So right now all these yellow stars denote folks who, um, who are kind of part and parcel of the kelp work that we do, either through, uh, through outreach projects or through enhancement projects um, that Aurora and I will talk on, will uh, talk about in this talk. All right, so really just for a little bit of context here, um, this beautiful illustration came out um, from uh, came out in the Seattle Times a couple of years ago, um, and I'll, I'll return back to to why why the Seattle Times artists were busy drawing kelp. We 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 think they should do that all the time. It's wonderful. Um, but really, why has kelp really come into the? Why, why is it kind of front and center, not just for us at PSRF, but I'd say kind of in the region in general? Well, and from kind of 2014 to 2019 we saw some catastrophic loss of kelp forests in California. Maybe some folks on this call are familiar with that, but it was big and it was bad. And it really brought kelp into the limelight, particularly through the lens of loss. This is also the same year up here in this neck of the woods that a really amazing community science project started through the Northwest Straits Initiative, uh, working with marine resource committees um, throughout, um, throughout Northwest Straits uh, um, areas. And those were community science, excuse me, community scientists out doing surveys um, on kayaks to map map kelp beds um, and map their uh, changes in the, the um, aerial extent of those kelp beds. And this is still, I like to focus on this every time I give a talk because this is really, this effort really is one of the, I'd say one of the kind of premier community science efforts uh, around kelp conservation and restoration um, in our region. And I'd say uh, well beyond our region as well. And then we also started to document some of the declines in our region. So here I'm showing um, I'm showing a map of South Puget Sound. Uh, so down you can see Olympia down there, um, and this was kind of one of the first distillations that that came out. Um, it, this was this was an earlier draft in 2020. And what we're seeing here, the colors show the last time looking when the when the team from DNR and elsewhere looked through charts, um, the last time that you could see evidence of bull kelp um, on these shorelines. And so the purple shows, all right, the pur the dark purple shows, well, in from 19, 1860 to 1880, that was the last time we saw kelp in those areas. So the, the lighter purple you get, that means that kelp has persisted. And then you get to the dark green, and that means that means that we still see the um, still see bull kelp in those areas. So there used to be kelp in all of the areas with color, and now there was only we only saw kelp in the areas with the dark green, which is a lot less area, sixty-seven percent overall linear extent, less area um, of bull kelp as compared to the maximum extent. So that's cause for concern. That's quite a bit of loss of of kelp beds. And so kind of with that, with kelp as this emerging issue due to the problems in California, um, due to what we were seeing on the water here, due to what we were seeing when compared to historical data, uh, a team uh, came together and wrote uh, a kelp plan, which is this, which has really been a great place to um, anchor a lot of the work, the Puget Sound Kelp Conservation and Recovery Plan, and its subsequent updating um, or kind of pulse check on the progress that we've made on the kelp plan, which has just been released. That came out in 2020, <laughs> right after COVID hit. Super fun. Um, but in that, we this, this broad-based team has identified six goals. Um, and in each of these goals, there's actually there's actions that we um that the team recommends that we take in order to be able to preserve, conserve, um, and restore kelp uh, in, in the Puget Sound area. So now we have a plan, we've got a team, Puget Sound Partnership then calls for the kelp indicator, says, okay, we've never really tracked kelp um, in our Puget Sound Partnership vital signs framework, but it's time, it's an important marine piece of marine vegetation and we should track it a bit more. And so they called for that a couple of years ago and just recently um, the, the indicator that's part of the vital signs framework has been released. 
And in that we can see more, we see a broader, uh, a kind of a broader brush stroke of the loss in our region. Uh, and what I'm showing here is a lot of different colors, right? And those colors represent the fact that we have quite a bit of variability. So green generally, as, as we're trained, trained to know, green means we're looking at some pretty stable bull kelp populations. Red means not so good. So we've been able to document a decline. And then there's areas like the yellow where we don't actually know if there's been a decline. We're a little data poor. Um, so we can't actually say much about it as well as the blue areas where we just straight up said there's insufficient data to be able to understand whether there's been a positive or negative change in the amount um, of bull cup that we're seeing uh, on the surface. So again, we're dealing with a complicated system, which kind of sort of begs the question, well, do we know why we're seeing these declines? <clears throat> Not necessarily. And that's really in part because last time I looked at a map of Puget Sound, we have so much variability in our shorelines. We've got a really complex fjord-like system here. Water moves in lots of different ways. So we've just got a pretty complicated seascape um, to, to look for pattern over. What we do know is that in general, the kelp loss that's been observed can be correlated likely with, with warmer waters, likely with low nutrient availability in some areas, also could be tied to a trophic imbalance or something going on in the food web. What we can also say thus far is one of the big players in the drama in California was the sea urchin. And that's not what we see driving our decline. Doesn't mean it couldn't in the future, but that's not where we're at right now. So then we keep on rolling and we keep seeing this momentum, this kelp wave just keeps getting bigger and bigger um, as, as folks, I think, uh, kind of embrace that we, we are seeing kelp loss. And there's a lot of momentum around um, conservation and recovery of this important habitat. So there we've got the kelp expedition, which I'll touch on briefly. Before that, we see an investment from the Washington State Legislature and a broad-based team of folks doing kelp conservation research and recovery. An Eyes on Kelp initiative, which I'll talk about a little bit. And then in 2022, the kelp and eelgrass bill, which sets us on a path to conserve 40,000 acres, um, conserve and or restore 40,000 acres of kelp and eelgrass in Washington waters. And 2023 has not slowed down at all, and 2024 does not look to be a, a slower year at all, which is amazing. The pause I want to take here is to note that we've never been part of um, we've never been part of a community that has been quite so uh, tightly knit, yet also quite inclusive, and has had so much momentum uh, around the conservation and restoration of a, of a marine habitat. Um, it's a really uh, positive and inspirational place to be, um, and I'm glad to be part of it, frankly. So the couple areas that I wanna talk about here um, before passing to Aurora, uh, the four, area, four kind of programs that we wanna highlight here. One, I'm gonna touch briefly on the kelp expedition. You'll see it has a big number one on it, and that should be somewhat indicative of what's coming next. Uh, the second one I want to talk about um, is this, this beautiful photo of a buoy uh, um, just off of Bainbridge Island looking back at um, downtown Seattle. This will be about a monitoring initiative that we have, the Azan Kelp Initiative. And then Aurora gets to talk about three and four, seed banking and enhancement work. So briefly, um, for the kelp expedition, what we wanted to do is exactly this. This is this is um, a quote from our executive director. When a foundational piece of our social and ecological systems begins to unravel, we need to join hands and take a leap towards collective action. And so that's just what we did in 2021. And the inspiration for the kelp expedition is actually something that I would encourage people to, to look into a little bit more, which is the evidence that actually First Peoples came to these lands by way of a kelp highway. So it was this protective strip of kelp beds that that kind of move comes on along, excuse me, fringes the continent all the way down, all the way down to the tip of South America, and that offered safe passage um, as well as sort of a a, a food source um, moving along. So not just the Bering Sea Land Bridge or the Bar Bering Land Bridge, but also um, by the way of a kelp highway. It's just a kind of fascinating thing to dig into. So the kelp expedition, which we've really captured in this um, in a story map that we put together, as well as your call to action wheel, which we loved putting together, a little something for everybody about what you can do um, to be engaged in kelp um, conservation research and recovery. 
The expedition took place in 2021, which we pulled off by hook and by crook in the second year of the pandemic. We had over 40 partners, close to 200 participants, and we worked our way from the Strait all the way down into Puget Sound proper, ending up um, in South Sound. And as our way of really drawing attention to kelp, um, collecting data, working with partners, and highlighting the collective importance of kelp um, in our region. We did this with kayaks, we did this with celebrations, we did this uh, with food, always with food. Um, we did this in media, we did this, you'll see an underwater, what are we calling it, Zach? An underwater drone, I love that. Um, and it was a really, uh, a really powerful experience. And this is where the Seattle Times picked this up, highlighted, um, highlighted kelp. I did a beautiful job um, doing so. We were able to get quite a bit more media coverage for the big collective effort, as well as produce a short video, which I would encourage folks to have a look at. It got picked up by PBS, um, Seattle Channel. And so it was really a great way to, um, to be kind of deeply engaged in this work and, and keep the momentum going, even as we were coming out of the pandemic. And that led, just a couple slides before I pass to Aurora, that really supercharged the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation to invest in monitoring through an Eyes on Kelp initiative. So this is a project of which we're in the third and final year of, coming up in 2024. And the recognition here is, it's really hard to collect data underwater. And we really need to invest in having more data underwater if we're to be able to track uh, declines in this important resource and understand how we want to design any interventions that we might make. So here I'm showing a map with, uh, with, <coughs> excuse me, with sites that are either that are proposed or in the process of being permitted, where we'll have these buoys um, out so that we can, in areas where kelp beds have historically been important and still have kelp for the most part, we can collect information on the um, on the environment. In really, in really, you know, really, what the kelp's experience um, in that area, so that we can detect and interpret change, research, restoration, and again, use that as a way to connect across the regional kelp and um, interests. And so, what these look like are just a simple instrument, simple buoyed, um, excuse me, simple instrument buoys um, with packages collecting information on temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, salinity, and light at the sea floor and the sea surface continuously. And then paired with this is uh, is the introduction of the Reef Check program to Washington. And so Reef Check is really based in California, but uh, but has done an amazing job bringing community science uh, to the forefront of the way in which we understand and track changes in biodiversity in the marine ecosystem. So here, uh, volunteer divers, as well as divers from other places like Department of Natural Resource, Resources, University of Washington, et cetera, et cetera, are trained to follow a specific protocol and then get in the water at sites and each year get a snapshot of what the biodiversity looks like in that kelp forest. Looking for fish, invertebrates, macroalgae, um, and then also doing a uniform, uniform point count um, on substrate and relief. And what I think is really amazing is uh, when Reef Check, when Reef Check came to Washington, I guess that's that could be some play on movie, I suppose. Um, before they came, we had, I'd say maybe a dozen sites that were, where different partners were doing these types of surveys and not always doing the same protocol. The first year we had a little over 20, and then in 2023, we've had over 50 sites shown here um, surveyed. And so the power of bringing community science uh, into the marine environment uh, is not lost on any of us. To be able to have this many folks out there doing a standardized survey, to be able to see what it looks like at these kelp beds throughout Washington waters um, on the outer coast as well, uh, as that data set comes together, I think that's going to be a really powerful um, data set for understanding and tracking change. And with that, I pass to you, Aurora. Thanks, Jody. Uh, thank you for all that awesome info on the history of PSRF and with the Kelp program. Um, yeah, like Clarissa said, I'm Aurora Segura. I'm the Habitat Lab Technician for Puget Sound uh, Restoration Fund, which basically just means that I do a lot of the day-to-day -day operations in our kelp lab um, at the NOAA Manchester site, which is really awesome. Cool. So a little bit more about bull kelp. Um, 
Bull kelp is an incredibly vital part of the Puget Sound's marine ecosystem and in many other coastal communities like Jody introduced us in. Um, it's a foundational species, meaning it plays many roles in creating a community and a food web. Uh, bull kelp provides homes to thousands and thousands of different organisms, all the way from tiny little snails to huge gray whales and everything in between. Um, and it connects a lot of different uh, ocean communities. Um, and without it, we lose a lot of really important species in our community. Um, along with that, uh, we see this more in the outer coast than we do in the Puget Sound, but it does protect, uh, bull kelp does protect coasts from erosion. So um, when big storms come in, it creates a buffer to make sure that the shore doesn't get um, as messed up with these giant uh, storms that can happen in like all this wave action. It's also a part of the nutrient cycle, which is a really vital role that it plays. Um, it's very similar to uh, the forests on the land and what the trees do for us on the land. Um, so that is our little forest underwater. Yeah, so uh, a couple of fun facts about bull kelp before we get into more of the nitty gritty of what PSRF does. Uh, bull kelp is an annual species, meaning it goes from a tiny little microscopic spore into this giant up to a hundred foot long plant and all within the span of a year. And because of that, it has a really, really quick growth rate um, that can go up to about 10 inches a day, which I think is just crazy and also super, super cool. So um, a little bull kelp anatomy before we get into some project stuff. Uh, starting at the bottom, we have the Holdfast, which is, as the name implies, super creative, holds the bull kelp to the ocean floor and make sure it doesn't get moved um, and we'll let it come up to the surface. Um, and then we have the stipe, which connects it up to the bulb and it's basically just like a long stem um, and that connects to the bulb. And the bulb is um, basically like this hollow pocket, this like air bladder that will keep all the blades up at the surface so that the blades are able to photosynthesize and do all that awesome stuff that plants do to get their energy. And on these blades, we have the saurus. And the saurus is, I think, one of the most interesting parts. Um, the saurus is this oblong shape that will form on the blade um, when it is reproductive season. And it will pop out of the blade like a cookie cutter, which is super cool. And you can see that in this second picture here, a little bit more towards the bottom, a piece of saurus that did pop out and how it's popping out at the top, which is super cool. And when it pops out, it'll float around in the ocean and eventually release its spores into the waters where all the future baby kelps will find a little spot to settle down in and grow up and give us these beautiful forests. Um, and in the next photo, we see the saurus um, in a tube in our lab. And so we're recreating that in a controlled environment and taking saurus that we collect from the wild and having it release spores in our lab. So then we can get the next stage of the kelp growth cycle, which is the gametophyte. And the gametophyte is this bottom picture in the right-hand corner um, that you can see right there that's under a microscope. Again, it's still in the microscopic stages. Um, and it's like this little pom-pom, which I think is really endearing. And we love to talk about our little pom-poms in the lab. It has like almost this fuzzy like structure. Um, and then from there, uh, after a couple of little things that we do in the lab, um, it'll go into the sporophyte stage. And the sporophyte stage is what we think of when we think of kelp. It's like these giant plants. Um, but in this next photo, we see the sporophytes just starting, like I said, in this microscopic little stage. And they're the beginnings of this 100 foot plant that it goes from that tiny underneath the microscope little guy to this huge, huge plant, which is incredible again. <laughs> Yeah, so in the lab, the stuff that we're doing, we're doing wild sporulation. Um, in the bottom left-hand side, you can see one of our old interns, Sophie O'Connell. Uh, she has a piece of kelp prepping it to come into the lab um, from wild sporulation. And from there, we have them growing in our gametophyte room, which is this really awesome, like I think really cool to look at, red room. Um, and we have them under red light so that they don't go into sporophyte stage before we're ready for them to get to that stage. It's very controlled um, and we don't want them to get to sporophyte yet so that we can get as much biomass as possible of gametophytes so we can have in the future as many plants as possible to outplant into our sites. And from there, the gametophytes will go into something called germplasm. Um, and germplasm is that seed bank. 
So the seed bank, super amazing work that we're doing. In my opinion, I think a lot of people's opinion, it's really novel work. Um, we learned a lot of these techniques from the Philippe Alberto lab in Wisconsin, which I know what you're thinking, Wisconsin, a landlocked state, which is crazy, but they're doing incredible kelp work out in Wisconsin. And um, they really led us through a lot of the stuff for the seed bank um, and helped us create our own seed bank and taught us everything we know. Um, in the seed bank at our kelp lab, we have 29 distinct populations currently. Um, and basically what the seed bank is, is we'll take those gametophytes that we grow up um, and we'll put them into these vials so that we're able to trace the genetic lineage of all the kelp that we're gathering from the wild. Um, we never, we like really rarely um, do wild sporulation to sporophyte growth. Um, we have them go through germplasm first so that we're able to track that lineage for some other cool projects that we'll talk about in a couple slides. Yeah, so some of our restoration projects. The reciprocal transplant, which is a really cool genetic project that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but next we have the tribal wildlife grant, which we are currently doing with Jamestown Skullum tribe, um, where they reached out to us and wanted um, assistance in creating their own seed bank. And we are growing up a lot of different um, kelp species for them, not just like the bull kelp like I've been talking about. Um, and we're doing that so that that tribe has access to traditional foods that they have um, in other kelp species found in the Puget Sound. And then with the Squaxin Island tribe, um, they reached out to us to um, help them regrow their historic kelp beds that they saw a lot of decline in with um, traditional knowledge and oral history. Um, and we're really, really excited to be helping them out with that. Uh, and then with our enhancement sites, um, our enhancement sites are basically just where we test new restoration project ideas. Um, and we have a lot of cool stuff, cool stuff up and coming with that, um, that we're not yet ready to share, but keep following us and we'll have some really cool stuff with that. In our next slide, we can talk more about the reciprocal transplant. So like I said, the reciprocal transplant at its core is a genetics project. Um, we're trying to understand how connected geographically distant beds are or aren't um, through whether or not they display local adaptation or a home field advantage. Um, so what we're doing is we are taking a population of kelp from in the Puget Sound and a population of kelp from the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and we are switching them. And we're switching them to see if the local adaptations give them any advantages with um, our ever-changing climate that we're seeing, or what's the story with that. And we're also creating um, a hybrid kelp population, or combining those two, and seeing how that grows up compared to wild and also the switched populations. So in the field, which is, I think, where the best photos come from, um, we take all those little gametophytes that I was talking about and we will put them into sporophyte stage and then we'll put those sporophytes onto a line of um, basically like twine and we will seed them on there and then outplant that line into the ocean where the kelp can grow up to that 100 foot length or more sometimes or less depends on the spot but um, they grow up into these giant plants out in the ocean where our dive team will monitor them and we'll take a lot of morphometric data, which just means that they are measuring bulb diameter, looking at um, uh, blade length, seeing when they go into reproduction, all that awesome stuff to just see how it's growing up after we, after our babies leave the lab. Um, and then at the top, you can see the surface surveys that we do. And with those surface surveys, um, we are monitoring some of the ones that we outplant, but also the wild populations of kelp, because we wanna see how they compare to the lab grown stuff that we're putting out there. And um, if we are making some good strides in that. And you can see some of the equipment in the top right-hand corner that we use to measure these things. Um, we have our stick of science, which is a really official term. And that's how we measure um, the length of the blades. And you can see how long they get in the left-hand side. And that's me holding a bunch of bull kelp. And I am almost indiscernible <laughs> amongst all the big blades. Yeah, so like I said, we do a lot of work with the tribes. And that's something that Puget Sound Restoration Fund puts at the forefront of our mission. Um, a lot of the times, tribes have historically not gotten um, the opportunity to do a lot of this restoration work, um, which is really unfortunate, but that's something that we really try to highlight because 
all the work that we're doing is extremely multifaceted and it's in interdisciplinary. We don't want to just help the communities under the water. We want to help them on the land as well. And so we really value tribal sovereignty and making sure that they are at the forefront in restoration um, when it comes to their territories and beyond. Um, so we had an intern from Jamestown Skullum tribe come with us, Sophie O'Connell, and you can see her on the right-hand side there with Brian Allen, our director, and they're doing some really cool work, like uh, the stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, and yeah, she came out and was with us for a few weeks to learn techniques on growing kelp, um, to help us out with creating that seed for Jamestown Skullum, and being able to then transfer that knowledge and those skills back to the tribe and be able to continue that work so that they can continue it over the years and be independent in that. And then on the left-hand side, we have um, our team and Jamestown Scollum's team um, out doing some cool fieldwork monitoring. And yeah, it's something that is very important to me personally. Um, I'm indigenous. So it's something that I was really looking for when I was trying to find um, conservation work and a organization to work with. So I am extremely honored and grateful that um, our org is able to do all this stuff and really values Indigenous voices. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for listening to PSRF's portion of it. You can see what we have growing on with our Instagram and TikTok, and you can also follow us along on our website. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both, Jody and Aurora. That was great. Let me pull up my slides. Okay, can you all see a slide deck? Excellent. And just to echo real quick, uh, one of the points that Jody touched on, I, I moved up to the Washington area in early 2022, and it is an amazing group of organizations and people up here. And it's really a pleasure to be able to, to get to work in such a engaged community that is, that is so focused on, on tackling this, this challenge of kelp loss. So with that, hello folks, my name is Zachary Randell. I'm a research scientist at the Seattle Aquarium. And for the past uh, year and a half or so, I've been working to develop uh, methods of using remotely operated vehicles in kelp forests. So another one of the points that Jody uh, mentioned was the need to collect data. And that is what we are all about uh, in this effort to develop these methodologies. So first, real quick, a shout out uh, to Megan Williams and Elena Bogdanova, uh, two research technicians working with me. Uh, Sean Larson is my supervisor and Clyde McQueen is a special projects volunteer. He's a retired software developer that has been uh, assisting us and he has been advancing our work um, significantly. There we go. All right. By way of background, uh, I'm a field biologist, so I, I was trained as a scientific diver. I, I mentioned that mostly to indicate that I'm not a roboticist and I'm not a software engineer or any sort of engineer, truth be told. Um, and I'm telling you this because if we can figure out how to use ROVs to develop standardized methods, other groups can absolutely do that as well. Uh, I spent uh, a fair amount of my time uh, in grad school at Oregon State University working out at San Nicolas Island, and it is an amazing place to work. Uh, shout out to Heather Fulton Bennett. I think I saw her in the audience. She actually came out and assisted with some of this work. Um, for the past 40 years, USGS divers have been going out to San Nick and collecting data underwater, just like Jody and Aurora touched on, performing that, that standardized methodology. And that was able to document some amazing patterns. So for example, we have these sites that shift back and forth between kelp forests and urchin barrens, and then other locations just about a kilometer away on the same island with the same predators, the same ocean conditions, the same nutrient profiles, everything, we see completely different dynamics. We see uh, persistent kelp forests across the decades. And it's amazing to see um, and I'm not going to get too much into the mechanism at all, actually, or, or the processes that we think are going on there. Instead, I'm going to show you the sites. And you can see those right here. The, the color here is bathymetry. So the red is the, the high rugosity. These are big bedrock structures. And then the dark blue, these are kind of flat areas. And what I want to note is these teeny little lines here. So these are the actual transects. These are where the divers, where we go down and collect our data time after time after time. 
And what I rapidly came across with in the course of my PhD was how limited we were able to extrapolate from that. So we weren't able to infer island-wide dynamics or anything about Southern California. We had these seven little vignettes, seven little examples of kelp forest community structure. And it got me thinking throughout the course of my PhD, what could we do to expand the area across which we're able to collect data from the seafloor? And that led us to ROVs. Uh, remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, they've been around for a while. They're typically large, um, expensive, deployed off large seafaring vessels to go deep into the ocean and do very cool things. Um, what they haven't historically been used extensively to do is go into shallow water, into diver depth locations, into kelp forests, for example. And that is just what we went about to try to change. Uh, while ROVs have typically been very expensive, that, that is changing. There's a company, Blue Robotics, out there, um, in addition to several others that sell relatively inexpensive hardware. Um, their ROVs are very capable. Um, all the code is open source. All the software is open source. And you can get a fully operational ROV up and running for less than 10K. Um, likewise, in addition to Blue Robotics, there's also sensors that you can get very, very sophisticated sensors, which can enable a, a high degree of uh, tracking or, or navigation with, with your vehicle that you can get for relatively little money as well. So with, with this new technology, we've been able to develop a program using small ROVs. And, and you can see the size here um, next, to, next to me and, and several others, Megan and Elena here. This is a, a pretty small ROV. Um, we have been able to successfully conduct surveys within kelp forests. Um, I have a ton of videos. I'm not going to show them here because they don't always stream super well um, in Zoom, but we can get in and out of bull kelp forests without too much trouble. The, the secret is we drive straight in. We don't do a lot of turning. We don't do a lot of funny business. And when we're done with our 50, 100 meter um, transect, we turn the ROV around, find the tether, and follow the tether back out of the bed. We, we essentially follow the, the trail right back out. Um, and we found that actually works pretty well. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the specifics of the methodology. We, we collect video data. So we are filming facing forward. We are filming downward. We are filming to capture all sorts of species that we encounter, the invertebrates, the kelp, the fish. Uh, the underlying substrate, the substrate type. So is it sand, shell debris, cobble, hard substrate? Um, we motor fairly slowly and methodically. Uh, the ROV can go down to 330 feet, um, though we haven't really gone that far. We've gone about half of that. Um, most of our surveys are about uh, five to 40 feet down. So uh, this QR code here, you'll see it again at the end. Basically, that will take you to a GitHub repository where we have a huge amount of information. So if you want to learn more, you can check it out there. We also have a lot of videos in the public domain. Okay, so projects underway. So we are working a project with the Port of Seattle. They are very interested in knowing why kelp thrives in certain locations of Elliott Bay and not others. So that's, this was the first project that we got underway and we have eight ROV sites throughout Elliott Bay. Um, we conduct four transects at each of those. And so you can see the GPS records and the subsequent maps of those here. Um, why there's a little kind of wiggle around them is that with one of our sensors, we're able to tell the altitude of the ROV above the substrate. And with a few calculations, we're basically able to calculate what's the area that we filmed. So the little wiggle here is the actual area that we filmed. And then the reason it, it varies a bit is because we're having to adjust the ROV's altitude as we go over varying terrain. And that's something I'll briefly touch back on. Okay, some other work. We've done um, multiple trips out to the outer coast, the Olympic coast of Washington. Uh, we had a few grants to do some outreach and education out there. We've been expanding upon existing partnerships and building up some new ones. Uh, a lot of these have been really fun events where, for example, the Macaw are able to take us out on their vessel uh, with some of the Macaw interns, and we were able to run the ROV in kelp forest and in urchin barrens offshore of Tatouche. Um, we've also done events with the Nia Bay School where we run the ROV on a sunken vessel in the Macaw Marina, which is very exciting. 
And then uh, a project that we're getting underway right now um, with money from WDNR and WDFW uh, via HSIL uh, has three main components. Uh, the first is actually partnering with Puget Sound Restoration Fund. So we're very excited about this. We're going to be running the ROV over their outplanted bull kelp restoration locations to see if the ROV can assist in some way in monitoring those outplanted areas. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is a methods comparison. We're going to be flying the ROV above some of the reef check uh, diver sites. So the scuba divers are going to lay out their meter tape. And then we're going to fly the ROV right over that meter tape, and then the divers are going to come in and collect that data. So the key thing here I want to emphasize is we're not trying to replace divers. I'm a diver. I want to keep diving. We view the ROV as an additional tool in our underwater toolkit to help monitor and conserve these ecosystems. So we need to understand that. We need to understand the differences in the types of data that are collected between the two platforms, divers and ROVs. The example that I always use is the camera facing down on the ROV is not going to be able to lift up the blade of sugar kelp and see the kelp crab underneath that the diver can. So those are the types of differences we want to be able to quantify. So that's number two. Number three is we're going to build upon a bull kelp habitat suitability model that Gray McKenna, formerly of Puget Sound Restoration Fund, started as part of a GIS project. Um, and Megan Williams is now in that same GIS class and is in the process of building upon that uh, habitat suitability model and incorporating ROV-derived metrics. So that, that finer scale species and substrate type that we can get from the ROV, let's see if we can use those data to at all inform that broader habitat suitability model. And so uh, we mentioned some AI in use here. I'll quickly touch on that. So Megan Williams is leading this work. So we use two main programs. Um, one is Viame. These are both um, open source, free to use, anyone can use it. Uh, this is for object detection. So objects are something that's individually conspicuous. It's kind of obvious where it begins and ends. So for example, in the forward facing view, this is how we get abundance counts for bull kelp. And you can put a box around each individual bull kelp stipe, or in the case of the blue, block, blue box here, uh, two stipes or even more. And then in the downward facing view, we can capture other objects such as sea stars or fish. Also with the downward facing view, we're using a program CoralNet, also open source and free to use to anyone. Uh, this is where we get at aggregate taxa. So something like fleshy red algae, it's kind of hard to tell where one individual ends and another begins. Uh, and that is where you can get instead a percent cover of, of uh, the organism or the category. So that's analogous to reef checks uniform point contact, which Jody briefly mentioned. So from this, we get percentages of red algae or brown algae, green algae, and also substrate type. So sand, shell debris, cobble, hard substrate, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna briefly walk through ROV positioning positioning a bit, primarily because it has taken us months to nail this down. And so I am going to bring you all along on the process. What you need to know when tracking the precise spatial positioning of an ROV underwater is that there's two main components. There's the underwater acoustics sending a signal from the ROV to the boat, and then the boat needs to get a GPS fix itself. And then those two sets of data are integrated and that gets you a GPS position of where that vehicle is underwater. And keep in mind, you can't get a GPS signal underwater, so you have to kind of go from one to the other. Now, this was a major headache for us for quite a while. We had a GPS system and while it did kind of sort of work, there was an awful lot of noise around it. These should be straight up and down transects where we flew the ROV and as you can see, they are not. We, we really want to know where the vehicle is because that's critical for the basics of navigation, going back to the same location to resurvey where you surveyed last year, and then any downstream analysis we're doing, including the, the spatial models, such as the habitat suitability models. So this was an issue. Uh, and this is where Clyde came in. Clyde is a retired software developer and actually wrote some custom code for us to harvest the raw acoustic information 
from that GPS system that we did not have access to without his code. And we were able to tell the raw acoustics actually look really good. This this is a, a pretty uh, appropriate representation of flying the ROV right offshore of the aquarium. So what we were able to learn is that the acoustic positioning half of that system working quite well, but the GPS, the little GPS receiver sitting right next to me while I drive the ROV, a lot of air around it, unfortunately. So what we did is we installed this fancy satellite compass. It gets a GPS fix. And Clyde, again, uh, came to the save with a custom Blue OS extension. So this is a custom piece of software that because the Blue Robotics system is open source, I mentioned that early on, we can incorporate new software. And this is a perfect example of that. So Clyde wrote something that is running on our ROV that feeds this information to the GPS system and thus enables much more precise spatial tracking. So this now is an acoustic track of us flying the ROV right offshore of Mushroom Rock with Macaw Fisheries Management uh, west of Nia Bay. And you can see there's kind of a lot of zigzag, a little bit of noise we can call that, um, but it, it doesn't look too bad. It's not like flying back and forth. This is now uh, the same dive with the Doppler velocity log. This is a very snazzy sensor with four acoustic beams that go down, bounce back up, and precisely track how the ROV moves across the seafloor. Now, this is a very, very accurate sensor, but it has no idea where it is in the world. So that's why we have both. We have the GPS to give us what we call the world frame to figure out where we are in the world, but then actually recording where the ROV goes, that's for the DVL. And what you can see here is that the DVL actually looks really, really similar to the acoustic GPS track. And so this was finally the evidence that we had that, hey, we have dialed in our GPS tracking system. And then next steps there, um, and something that Clyde actually was able to figure out since I made this slide, is integrating both of those sets of information into the vehicle in real time in order to fuse the data. So we call that sensor fusion. And so that's something we're now able to do to get a more precise position. Okay, next steps with that, just to round out the software portion, um, Clyde is also working on something called surf track. So this is going to enable the ROV to maintain a consistent altitude above the seafloor. When we're doing these surveys, they're really fairly simple. We, we just slowly move the ROV forward while filming, but we're constantly having to adjust the altitude because the seafloor is not perfectly flat, but it kind of varies. We want to keep that ROV at a nice one meter above the seafloor to keep our imagery nice and consistent. So we're constantly having to do these little adjustments. So this software that Clyde is working on and has tested is going to automatically adjust the altitude of the ROV for us. And that's going to be a game changer for our surveys. Uh, and that, like all the software that he does, is going to be open source. So others will be able to make use of that as well. Uh, we've also started playing around with mission planning. So this is uh, programming the, the precise locations that we want to survey and let the ROV do that autonomously. Um, as it turns out, there's actually a lot of code already in the, the ROV firmware that does these types of autonomous operations. Uh, it's just not enabled because you really, really need to know the position of the vehicle underwater before you can go about flying it autonomously. So now that we've dialed in that positioning component, um, it's kind of opened up some new frontiers for uh, mission planning. And we can, in the winter at least, we can't do this in the summer with the canopy kelp, but in the winter, we could fly back and forth and image a, a very large area, or at least a, a decent sized area relative to what we were able to do previously. Okay, next steps. So we are actually in a process of uh, revising multiple aspects of our surveys. Um, Sony's about to release this camera. It should come out any day if it's not out already. Um, it is designed uh, specifically for integration into quadcopters and drones, or in our case, ROVs. Uh, it's a full frame camera, so it's a very, very capable sensor, uh, much more than the, the GoPros, which we're currently using. Uh, so that's going to be a serious upgrade for our downward facing camera. And what our hope is, is that we will be able to use that to capture imagery of high enough quality that we can start reconstructing 3D models, which these figures give examples of 
Um, so our plan is to generate those 3D models in the winter time. We can go back and forth, just like I showed on that previous slide, when the, the bull kelp is absent. And then in the summertime, we can go back and subsample those locations. So when, when we have to fly straight and we're kind of constrained due to the bull kelp, we can run our multiple transects in that broader area, which we have previously imaged. And then we can overlay those abundances on those uh, three-dimensional uh, metrics of the seafloor that we would have surveyed and calculated previously. So it's kind of a two-part survey effort to try to understand more about that system. All right, pulling back from the weeds a bit, uh, just a fun thing to note. So we've done uh, numerous education and outreach events. Kids love the ROV. We actually fly it with an Xbox game controller, um, which you can see right here. Where's my mouse? Right there, Megan is flying it with the Xbox game controller. We let the kids fly it in the pool, and we actually let them fly it in the ocean, too. Oftentimes, the kids have experience with video games. They actually catch on really quick how to how to pilot it, and they're kind of zipping through the pool. That's kind of cool to see. Um, so it's it's been really fun as a way to engage kids with STEM. And what's interesting is how many different ways you can approach it. You can approach this and get something out of it uh, in the field of robotics or research or species conservation or species restoration or education or coding. Um, there's multiple ways that you could become engaged from something like that. So that's been a lot of fun. I'm trying to get our conservation education and learning department to perhaps think about getting an ROV of their own because there's some amazing programs that they could develop for the aquarium guests. Okay, um, another really fulfilling part of our work has been helping others get similar programs up and running. So I mentioned it at the beginning that if I can do this as a diver, anyone can do this. Uh, that QR code that I sent links to all the hardware we're using, all the locations where you can get it. We link to all the code that we use for processing the telemetry files, for working with the data, analyzing the data. Uh, it's basically a, a shopping list and a recipe for if you wanted to do something similar, you could. And I can tell you right now, everything that we're doing, about 30, 35K. Um, it's a decent chunk of money, but if you're writing a grant, you can write that into a grant if it's if it's a big enough grant. So multiple folks have already got uh, similar ROVs up and running. We went out with the two Lalip and demonstrated proof of concept that our downward facing camera could pick up uh, gooey duck siphons. So the two Lalip are responsible for monitoring and managing um, that fishery species and their waters. And so they're very interested in um, pushing deeper than their divers could go and covering more area. So it's been a lot of fun working with them, helping them get their own ROV program up and running. The port, likewise, um, they've been very supportive of our work and they now have their own ROV as well. So that's a really fulfilling part. And if anyone is interested in doing something similar, just uh, drop me a line. So I think that is all I have for you. So there's that QR code. Again, if you're interested in learning more about the work, and with that, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate uh, the invitation to talk here. So thank you. Of course. Thank you all for sharing about your current work and research. That is so cool to see. I hope everyone has some bubbling questions to ask you all. So we're going to open up our Q&A. We got so enthralled in these presentations, we don't have too much time, but if our presenters do have a bit to stick around, we can see about answering any of your questions that you have for them. I can get things rolling with the first question for Jody: is how can we get involved in the reef check? Or how can anyone get involved in the reef check? I will put a link in the chat. Um, it's very easy to get involved. It's a great group. I'm a huge fan of the Washington coordinator. Um, so I'll go ahead and just move that right to the to the chat. Perfect. And then Zachary, I have a question for you about will those 3D seafloor models be available to the public? 
I am trying to make everything we do public, frankly, um, to put it out there in the public domain. So we haven't generated them yet. So uh, to be determined, but we're, we're aiming that way. Yes. Amazing. Um, we got our first question from Fred. Uh, how is all of the ROV camera data analyzed? Is it or can it be automated? Yes, yes. So we we are in the process of doing that. So we're we're training AI algorithms to pull out species and percent cover categories. We are in the the annotation phase. So that's where we're basically training the program to determine what these things are. That's that's a long process, and it's it's a it's a human involved process. So we're clicking on the thing or putting the box around the C star. But it's an investment, and the more you do that, the the better and better the algorithm gets. So our coral net program, it's already predicting most, most everything. So when we go through, when our AI teacher volunteers in particular, um, and Megan Williams is leading that group and leading that training, when they go through, they're, they're reviewing the predictions of the algorithm already. And our algorithm's at about 68, 69, 70% accuracy. Pretty good. Uh, are any of the programs using upwelling technology? Um, I'm not familiar with upwelling technology. Um, we don't use we use upweller downwellers for uh, the shellfish that we grow, but we don't use it necessarily in, in when we're doing the seeding for bull kelp. Um, we do uh, we have been using we have been growing um, some bull kelp and tumble culture, which is similar to an upwelling technology, and that's working pretty well. Um, we do that on site at Manchester where Aurora works, um, and the hope is that we can do tumble culture and continue to grow the kelp in these big tanks, um, so that we can use that kelp to feed our abalone and our abalone program, and also use it for research um, purposes. Follow up to that: How has outplanted kelp been doing? Yeah, so um, last year, I believe, was the first year that we outlanched kelp like on a larger scale from the kelp lab. Um, and this is also the first year that the kelp lab has been ramped up to full operation um, and we're like pretty fully staffed right now. Um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, the Squaxin Island kelp that we outplanted um, is doing well. There has been some munching on there by kelp crabs, um, always eating away. Um, Jody, I don't know if you have more to add on to that because I was not here last year, so I'm not sure how that outplanted kelp is doing. Yeah, so we have two sites where we've been doing outplanting. Aurora beautifully described the work at Squawks, and we were thrilled that that kelp took. We tried some new methods. We didn't know if it was going to take, and this is an area that is the really warm, and it's an area where we're seeing rapid kelp loss, and that kelp grew, and we were thrilled. The main area where we've been re doing restoration is in central Puget Sound. And this year was the fourth year in a row where we've successfully regrown um, our kelp from these tiny microscopic kelp that Aurora walked through all the way from, uh, from sea floor to surface, um, producing really a kelp curtain that hasn't been present at that site um, since the 1990s. We need it to persist and come back on its own and it hasn't done that. However, that kelp curtain, when it's there, and if we plant it, is just full of fish. Um, and we're really happy to see that. And it's a big progress, and we have a ways to go. Well, good to hear that there's progress for that. Um, Aurora, are there plans to reach out to other tribes for citizen research? Um, so a lot of the tribal work that we do, tribes will reach out to us. Um, and we are like essentially the tool that they use to be able to complete the projects that they're envisioning, um, like the ones that I described. Um, a lot of the, um, I think what you're talking about, citizen um, knowledge is a lot of oral history that we hear from tribes when we speak to them about where kelp forests have historically been seen. And um, yeah, that's something that is really vital to understanding the history that like Jody was talking about with seeing where the kelp has been and where it's declined. Um, and it's also like something that we um, work to incorporate when we are thinking of researching um, spots to outplant kelp in. Um, 
But yeah, for the most part, uh, the tribes will reach out to us um, and we don't really do a whole lot of um, asking them. Thank you, Aurora. Um, how feasible do you think this system would be in kilt beds of other canopy species? Um, yeah, I think it's super feasible. Um, uh, one of the barriers, though, with growing it in lab is there's not sometimes for certain kelp species, especially native species. Um, we don't know what we don't have any recordings of what their gametophyte stage looks like. Um, the, we recently ran into this issue in our lab when we were growing up um, kelp for Jamestown Scollum tribe, and we were doing it with um, Simitheri tripicata. And when looking at the gametophytes, we couldn't tell super well the difference between the male and the female gametophytes, which poses a problem for the work that we do, just because there isn't a lot of research on it. Um, so we were actually doing some novel stuff with letting them go to spore fight to see which would um, let them go into like gametogenesis to produce eggs or sperm to see which is male and female. Um, so that's like a big issue is just like lack of knowledge with not knowing what it looks like in those early stages because it just hasn't been recorded before. But that being said, uh, we at the Kelp Lab at Manchester um, have been successfully growing um, two other species for the tribes of kelp. And those are not canopy, but they are like the lower um, part of the kelp forests. And they're going really well, actually. I'm really proud of our cultures and how they're looking. They look really healthy and strong. And we just went into the next stage of um, getting them prepped to go into our germplasm. So really good job there to our kelp uh, lab researchers. And yeah, I think it's definitely feasible and it's something that I'm really passionate about. Well, how cool. Glad that there's more than just bull kelp that we can grow, that we can grow more of them. Um, one for you, Zachary, uh, any especially exciting critter finds on the ROV footage from Elliott Bay or elsewhere? Yeah, so not Elliott Bay, but I got a thing for the urchin barons. They're so wild to see. So that that's been interesting off offshore of Tatouche. Uh, closer to home, we've had some fun encounters with harbor seals underwater. We also had one with an octopus on a on a tire reef of all things in Elliott Bay. Uh, but we saw an octopus, and we have this on our website, uh, basically mimicking some sort of invertebrate, and it kind of shrunk down and then was walking on its legs. And it approached the tire reef and then there was a rock crab that I think might have thought it was some sort of competitor because the rock crab came out, claws open and actually charged the octopus. And the octopus, which I mean, a crab charging an octopus is like, <laughs> you have a death, death wish. Um, but the octopus broke broke the mimicry and, and then swam away. It was super cool to see, just kind of an odd, fortuitous thing. Wow, octopuses are amazing. <laughs> um, for any of you, are you looking at any connections between kelp restoration, conservation, and carbon sequestration? I got this one. Um, good. Uh, right. I mean, this is this is this is the talk of the, this is. I'm sure all of you will be talking about this at your holiday parties. I know I probably will be because this is definitely a hot topic, right? Um, so are we looking into the connections between the restoration and conservation of carbon sequestration? I mean, the first thing to really understand more is, uh, does, uh, to what degree does kelp and, and do individual species, specific species of kelp, um, store or sequester carbon in what ways for what length of time, right? Because the actual sequestration discussion is much more than just what's going on within one season of kelp growth. It is about what is that really that long-term quasi-permanent storage of carbon that the kelp is facilitating. Um, and that's a really kind of big and multi-layered question. Um, there's there's a good new report that's coming out that just recently came out um, by the Nature Conservancy that digs into this a little bit more as well as exploring what the role could be for kelp um, farming for in carbon markets. Um, and there's there's just a lot more to unpack there. Uh, ultimately, it's, you know, again, what we learn time and again is 
Biogenic habitats are not silver bullets. And again, if kelp is not a silver bullet when it comes to carbon storage and sequestration, we're gonna have to do some things on our end, not just put a whole bunch of trees and kelp out there to, to continue to feed our carbon habits. Well said. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining. I think that's all the time we have for. Um, well, I definitely have some hope for our kelp forest now. We've got some great organizations and a ton of other organizations, as we saw, that are contributing to helping our kelp forests in Puget Sound. Um, thank you so much again, Zachary, Aurora, and Jody, for spending your evening sharing about this amazing work with our community. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and listening in and having those really great questions. I hope you do get to spend your holidays with your families talking about how great kelp is. It'd be a wonderful sight to see. Um, if you did the coloring page throughout the night, I hope you can share those with us. We love to see them. Uh, we also, if you want to tune in to our next Discovery Speaker Series, you can follow us on social media or get our monthly events newsletter by signing up for that on our website, and we'll send you the link for the next one. Um, otherwise, thank you all for joining, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.